All right, we will go ahead and get started. Hello everyone and welcome to the Specialty Crafts Risk Management webinar series. Today's webinar is the fifth of this 10 webinar series and we're happy to have you all joining us today. This series is funded by the North Central Extension Risk Management Center. I'm Olivia Hamlin, Education Extension Specialist for Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. I work in the Farm, Food, and Enterprise Development Program, which works largely with specialty producers on a wide variety of education and outreach topics. Joining us today is Dr. Ajay Nair. Dr. Nair is an associate professor working in the area of sustainable vegetable production in the Department of Horticulture here at Iowa State University. The focus of his research, extension, and education program is on cover cropping, conservation tillage, nutrient management, soil amendments and health, and season extension strategies in vegetable production. He works closely with commercial vegetable growers, extension staff, industry representatives, and stakeholders to meet the rising demand of locally grown produce and enhance the profitability and sustainability of vegetable production systems. If you have any questions for Ajay as we go through our presentation here, go ahead and drop them in the chat box and we'll get, the, get those answered as we go along. With that, I will hand it over to you, Ajay. Thank you, Olivia, and uh, greatly appreciate the invitation to uh, talk about risk management in, in vegetable crop production. It's a, it's a, it's a very important topic, uh, uh, which is, you know, um, active all throughout the growing season and even into the marketing of the produce. So thanks again uh, for bringing attention to this uh, important topic. So uh, uh, risk management, uh, you know, uh, first we have to, I thought I'll provide some statistics in terms of uh, vegetable uh, acres uh, that are uh, 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 being uh, produced or grown here in Iowa. Uh, we have a total crop land of about uh, 26 million acres. Uh, and uh, vegetables are a small part of it. We are only uh, 7,700 uh, acres. Uh, but the economic value and the uh, income that generates, uh, it's quite substantial. Uh, we don't have that many acres, but these vegetables are you know, high value produce, more net income for the grower. Uh, and uh, uh, to that, you know, a, a shout out to uh, some of our uh, field crop producers like corn soybean growers is that many of our vegetable producers are both field corn producers as well. So what we are seeing here is that uh, you know, field crop producers are slowly expanding or at least diversifying a small portion of their land uh, to specialty crops and uh, vegetables uh, being one of them. So that's an interesting thing. So uh, risk management uh, cannot come into uh, uh, more of a forefront uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the uh, Iowa State Fair. So uh, I judge the uh, 4-H uh, entries uh, uh, for, for vegetable uh, uh, you know, production. And you can imagine the amount of stress these uh, 4-H, <laughs> 4-Hers are going through when they're growing produce that has to be shown at the Iowa State Fair. So they are taking or managing a lot of stress uh, and a lot of risk uh, when growing these beautiful tomatoes or onions um, you know, or peppers, and I mean, look at the, the quality here. Look at the uh, the uh, the okra and the uh, and the onions, the uniformity, and so they have managed their risk really well. So this is just a a, a small, you know, fun part of risk management. Is that risk management is everywhere? There's a lot of risk in anything we do, and. and uh, in this case, the 4-Hs have done a great job in managing their risk to get their entries and get those ribbons, uh, th those coveted ribbons. You know, talk about you know, pumpkins, you know, uh, people winning the largest pumpkin. This is, I believe, from 2018. Uh, this is uh, Dave, da uh, Dave Davis from Bloomfield, Iowa. First place, 795 pound pumpkin. Uh, so I'm sure he has taken a lot of risk making sure that particular flower is pollinated properly, that fruit forms nicely, and there is no other thing affects that affects that fruit that is developing. So a lot of risk management to be the first person, to win the first prize. Uh, and this is the second and the third prize, not, not that far behind, you know, 717 pounds and 606. So a little bit of fun to the risk management, although this is a very important and very, uh, very uh, a serious topic at times. Uh, as I said, 7,700 acres of vegetables and uh, the top five vegetables that are grown here in Iowa uh, in terms of acreage, uh, sweet corn, pumpkins, um, green beans, and, and, and green peas 
uh, would be the top five, including the potatoes uh, there. So, uh, and you will see that a lot of these crops, for example, sweet corn, uh, pumpkins, potatoes, are, are grown uh, in the open field condition with a lot of risk. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, anxiety and a lot of management things that need to be taken care of to safeguard these uh, crops when it comes to environmental factors, for example, hail, um, you know, wind, you know, uh, too much of rain, too less of rain. Uh, so uh, risk is an inherent part of uh, specialty crop production, which includes the vegetables. So let's see what the situation on ground is. Uh, we know, you know, definitely there is rising energy and input costs when we are growing our produce. Uh, a lot of input in terms of uh, our own time, labor, uh, input, fertilizer, insecticide, pesticide, you know, um, managing these crops, scouting, trellising. I mean, there's so many things. And so there's a lot of, you know, there's increasing cost. Uh, labor issues I, I highlighted earlier, you know, it's hard to attract skilled labor. I mean, you labor is something and skilled labor is another category. So uh, many of our uh, uh, specialty crop producers, vegetable producers who want to expand, uh, the, the big concern for them is to get skilled labor. Uh, so that's a risk. You know, if you want, you want to expand because you know there is market, but there's a risk to it because you might not be able to hire the skilled labor you want. Uh, and, and, and that could be a predicament, you know, if you want to expand your farm size or, or, or your business. Uh, economic factors, you know, soil, water, environmental quality issues within intensive agriculture. And of course, this new, uh, not new, but something that is getting more traction and, and definitely more uh, attention is the food safety aspect, uh, which is again a very critical aspect uh, of not just during the production cycle, but after production, you know, how are you handling your produce? How are you selling it? Uh, so that's also coming to the forefront. So food safety risks are, uh, are also uh, uh, very important to handle. Some of the positive things, you know, looking at the positive side, we see more young agriculture graduates who are slowly taking over. And many of the uh, students who are, you know, take, for example, in my class here in vegetable production, uh, these students go back home and maybe ask for an acre or two acre of land from their mom or dad. And, and, this, this, and, and they started oper a vegetable operation. They might maybe set up a high tunnel and, and grow tomatoes or peppers or, or maybe get into sweet corn production. Uh, so uh, this is something happening in the state and, and I'm very pleased about it that, you know, uh, diversification is happening, which is one of the uh, uh, tenets when it comes to risk management. How do you diversify your farm? Uh, local food movement is obviously propelling all, all this, providing the momentum that is needed. And of course, uh, high tunnels, uh, which have become a game changer. Uh, when it comes to improving the yield and the quality of the produce uh, in a manageable size. You know, a typical high tunnel is a uh, 30 by 96 structure. So uh, how can you intensively grow in there with a lot of uh, uh, control, which the high tunnels provide us and get to high quality and high yield produce. So uh, those are some good things that are happening on the ground. So an overview and, and my talk today uh, you know, I, I just put these three major parts, but I will talk more about the production risk, how to manage your production risk, uh, uh, which could include abiotic and biotic factors, you know, abiotic water, nutrients, uh, biotic insects, you know, disease, weeds, you know, how do you manage them and, and minimize your risk. There is a risk there. I mean, there's no, no, no doubt about it, but how do you mitigate it or how do you keep it low? Environmental risk, drought, excess rain, inclement weather. So some of the tools uh, and approaches, uh, and I'll talk about that, that can help you minimize that risk. And of course the market. And then I know uh, uh, this whole webinar series, there are uh, speakers who are coming and talking about market risk as well. So uh, you will get some good uh, useful information there. And market ri risk could be pricing, supply and demand, You know, market access. When are you getting into the market? Is it close by? Uh, and all those things uh, uh, play into the risk management uh, uh, aspects. So when it comes to vegetable production, you know, uh, uh, thinking of a grower, thinking from the perspective of a grower, you know, there are so many things. Uh, nutrient management, you know, soil health, pest and diseases, of course, food quality, crop rotation, biodiversity, and I could add many more. Uh, drift issues, uh, which has been increasing. 
uh, uh, many of our growers are have had issues where you know uh, uh, drift had either affected or or killed their uh, uh, plants, and, and and that's also very sticky discussion, you know, of how it happened and why it happened, and and of course we provide support in terms of how can we minimize that. But but from the vegetable grower perspective, there are so many things uh, that person has to manage, or at least you know, or, or juggle. Uh, and so that, that that creates a lot of anxiety among our, our vegetable producers. So I will, uh, what I have done is I've uh, uh, chopped my presentation into smaller pieces um, and we'll talk about different sections or, or aspects uh, that will talk about risk mitigation in that area. So um, one of the most primary one is the uh, site selection aspect of uh, number one, for beginning growers and even for growers who are you know, advanced but they want to rotate their crops from one location to other, uh, the, the most important thing which they can do to mitigate their risk is to make sure that they put their crop uh, in a site that is suitable for it. You know, site selection is key and within site selection, soil quality and topography, what is the type of soil, I'll, I'll talk more about it, availability of irrigation water, you know, climate, the growing season, of course, we can't do much if you know, you're set to a farm or set to an area. But of course, thinking about what crops you can grow based on the growing degree days, uh, that is one way to mitigate risk. Existing structures, can you incorporate high tunnels? Again, I'll discuss all this in detail. Is there a cooler for you to uh, harvest and store your produce before, it before you take it to the farmer's market or the CSA? Members come in and, and take it or you deliver you know, building access and buildings, traffic pattern, if it's a UPIC operation, um, proximity to a city or a town, uh, local competition, you know, that's also part of a risk management tool. You're thinking of, are there some things which you would rather not grow because there's another grower who's doing a really good job and has already captured the market. I'm not saying that you should not be growing that, but that is an, another uh, point to think of uh, as a risk management tool of what crops you should grow and, and are there any niche crops that nobody else is growing, which you can grow and minimize your risk uh, in, in marketing that and, and creating a demand for it. Of course, labor is very important. Um, you know, prior stewardship of the land, you know, herbicide use, fertility, crops, and I'll discuss things uh, in detail, but those are some things which are tied up with the site selection aspect of where are you going to plant or establish your, uh, your uh, enterprise, a vegetable production enterprise. So uh, 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 key factors, but I will, you know, there are many things, but I will discuss uh, uh, the soil quality and topography. Yeah, I'll talk about irrigation, high tunnel, uh, insects and pests, uh, some aspects of local uh, competition. And of course, labor is kind of embedded uh, in there. So uh, finding the right site, the right soil, that is where your risk management begins. That is how you uh, limit the amount of risk you are taking by making sure that you have done, you have critically assessed the soil where you are going to plant. Again, uh, this, this is very simple and straightforward, but oftentimes not practiced. Uh, I know growers might have a set amount of land and, and, and they have a rotation they have in mind and they can't move around too much, but at least knowing what they have in their soil uh, is critical because if you know what you have in the soil in terms of nutrients, uh, it also gives you an idea of what the pH and other uh, factors are and make sure you add things to make bring things in balance. So the, the, the risk management starts with knowing what your soil is. So, so mitigate production risk by knowing your soil. And one of the tools which you know, I, I mentioned, again, this is more of a thing for you to start looking into. And once you have some information, you don't have to keep going back to this, but the USDA has, has this, uh, NRCS has this uh, a web soil survey uh, portal. So if you, go, if you just type NRCS web soil survey or USDA web soil survey, you land up with this page. You can click this button called start WSS. Okay, so you click that, it brings up this big, huge map of United States. You put your address in, in this case, just to show you as an example, I put the address of the research station, the horticulture, Re ISU horticulture research station. So uh, in the address on the left-hand side here, uh, I, I put this address, uh, I click enter, it 
pops to this page. Now here I can see my research station. I see the buildings. I see some of the plantings. Uh, and then I go to this tab called the AOI, which is the area of interest. So I can click on that and I can zoom any area in at this location. So I click that AOI and I zoomed one area of the farm. This is what the uh, output looks like. It tells me that this particular soil, I, this is the north end of the farm. Um, this particular area has different types of soil. It has primarily 138C2, 138B, 55. Uh, so those are the three types of soil in there. So at least the first in, at this first instance, instance, I know there are three different types of soil. And if you click on each one of these, like 138C2 or, or 138B or 55, it will give you information um, in terms of uh, what is there in that, in that soil. So then you go and click the uh, Soil Data Explorer. And when you click that, you see all plethora of information there, you know, soil chemical properties, calcium carbonate, soil erosion factors, health properties, EC, pH. Now I'm not saying that this is going to replace your usual soil testing, uh, which you have to do every year, but this is giving a general idea of what the land layout is. What is the slope? Uh, what is the drainage? So before you plan to put an acre of tomato or a half an acre of strawberries or three acres of peppers, you kind of know where, what the soil properties are and decide accordingly. So Web Soil Survey is an excellent resource for that. And when you click the soils map, you were, I told you about those soil uh, this, uh, classification, which we saw there. It tells you what that particular type is. This is more for scientific uh, use, but when you click on it, you get some idea about, okay, is it more clay? Is it more sand? Is it more silt? Uh, so this is an excellent piece of information uh, which you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tab, in, uh, tap into. Of course, soil, and again, I'm just showing you the, uh, uh, the way it works. Soil map, you can click Soil Data Explorer, you can go to Soil Properties, and then Soil Chemical Properties, and, and, and that way, uh, going back, you can, you can pull the history of that soil. So knowing your soil is absolutely important. Now that's the first step. The second step is to, uh, to mitigate the risk, production risk, is to know what is in there in your soil. So uh, uh, I highly recommend uh, doing a soil test, a general soil test. It can happen, uh, the best ideal time to do it is in the fall. Once you're done with all the production, you know, maybe October, November, if you can go and sample and, and send your sample in, so you have the results. So if some things need to be changed, you can change it uh, by the time the next year comes or the production cycle starts. So in a typical soil test, you know, pH, which helps with lime recommendations, it gives you organic matter that helps with nitrogen recommendation, cation exchange capacity, phosphorus and potassium, how much to apply in the next growing season, depending on what crop, uh, magnesium and calcium, micronutrients. You don't have to test for micronutrients every year. I would suggest every three to four years because that test is a little bit more expensive if you add that on to a general test, but a general test usually costs anywhere from 15 to $20. Uh, so uh, doing a soil test, uh, in the fall is best. If you're not able to do it in the fall, no, no worries. You can do it early in the spring, but the fall is better. The reason why fall is better is that if you do the sampling in the fall and it uh, comes, uh, uh, the results show that you have a very high so, uh, soil pH. Let's say your soil pH is 8 or 8.5. Now you are too much in the basic side. You need to bring the pH down and the easiest way to do it is by using elemental sulfur. Uh, so uh, you apply elemental sulfur and the pH will come down. And we here at Iowa State can provide you with that information in terms of how much to apply if you share their soil test results with us. So myself and there are other field specialists, Joe Hannon, Patrick O'Malley, we can all help you with those uh, recommendations. But to, coming back to the sulfur uh, point, so sulfur, so you apply sulfur in the fall uh, and it takes about six to eight months for that soil pH to come down from 8.5 to maybe 7.5. Uh, or, or 6.5 be mo being more ideal, six to eight months. So imagine if you find your soil pH is very high in the spring, you don't have much time to bring that soil pH down by the time you plant in May. Uh, so that's why it is important to do the soil testing in the fall so you can make those corrections and be prepared to procure or, or, or source the fertilizers uh, uh, or elemental sulfur or lime if the pH was low. Uh, in the fall or the spring, and you're not caught up uh, at the end, uh, right when the big, the, at the beginning of the growing season. 
this shows the soil pH. Uh, this, this figure, most of the vegetables uh, grow well in a soil pH of 5.8 to 7. That's why it's important to get the soil pH numbers in the fall. Uh, so if you need to correct it, you can correct it then and there. Uh, with the lime application, let's say your pH was low and you want to increase it, increase it, you can do it in the fall, but you can do it in the spring as well. But with elemental sulfur, if you want to bring the pH down, you need to apply it in the fall. <clears throat> so I'm slowly pivoting towards how nutrients, how manager nutrients helps you mitigate risk. Uh, we, I hear this uh, all the time. You know, Iowa has got great soils and you, we are blessed. And oftentimes, you know, that kind of sits in our brain and, and we, we don't think of nutrition or, or applying fertilizers. It could be both organic or inorganic. Uh, we, don't, we don't give more priority to that of, you know, making sure that all our crops are getting the right amount of nutrients, the right amount of phosphorus, the right amount of potassium and nitrogen and calcium and magnesium. We think that the soil is pretty good. And so we kind of take a backseat when it comes to fertility. So please don't do that. Make sure with the soil test, we will know what is deficient or what is less in what range they are. And you need to add that for specific crops so that you can get the optimum yield. You can get the optimum quality. Because the last thing you want to do is do everything in great in terms of planting and, and you know, managing, but the soil fertility was not there. Uh, the optimum fertility and, and you suffer because of that. So risk management by managing your fertility well is the easiest thing to do. It's not very challenging, not very difficult. It's easy. You just have to do it. So this is an example where the tomato fruits are showing potassium deficiency. And this is shown by this yellow shoulders or green shoulder. It's known as the yellow shoulder disorder. This could have been easily uh, uh, mitigated or, uh, or limited uh, by making sure your soil has the right amount of potassium at the time of planting. So again, here's where the soil test comes handy. If you knew the soil test, you knew the potassium was low, you could have applied it and gotten rid of this, this problem. Uh, the sad part of this problem is that the grower or, or the farmer observes it, you know, second harvest, third harvest, and then 50% of the harvest is showing yellow shoulder disorder. So the fruit is non-marketable. So you have lost the market for that produce and this becomes non-marketable. And so it's a great loss. It's not during when the crop is growing. You, there are some symptoms which the plants will show in their leaves to tell you, hey, you know what? I am deficient in potassium. But when it comes to this stage, you have lost two or three harvests. So, so manage your risk by making sure you apply the potassium at the right time and the right amount. Some more pictures. Uh, how the yellow or the green shoulder looks like. Again, th these fruits become uh, non-marketable. Uh, this is a symptom of the leaf showing potassium deficiency. So this is cucumber and you see the edges of the leaves are scorching. Uh, they start by yellowing, the edges will start yellowing. And if you don't take care of it, you can see this image here on the left-hand side, this leaf, you can see the start of potassium deficiency. And this is more of the final stage. <clears throat> so, um, when you scout, when you walk through your fields and your plots, when you see this, you know there is potassium deficiency. You need, to, you need to immediately apply potassium at that point. It would have been great if you would have applied it early, but at least you know what the symptoms look like. And so you can mitigate this risk by applying the right amount. Uh, how can you do that? I mean, there are many potassium fertilizers out there, potassium chloride, 0060, potassium sulfate, 0050, potassium nitrate. Many of our vegetable growers use this. This is the water soluble fertilizer, which they can send through their drip irrigation or fertigation system. Uh, and, and that form is uh, preferred by many vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers. They like that nitrate form of nitrogen. So, uh, and the potassium that comes along with it. So uh, uh, it's easy to manage. If you uh, don't have a fertigation system, uh, you can, and you can buy from the co-op, 0060 or 0050 potassium sulfate, and just apply it pre-plant, you know, just till it in. And that's another way to uh, uh, mitigate uh, the potassium uh, risk. Another thing, we, we're still on the nutrient aspect, blossom and rot, this is tomato. And this is caused by calcium uh, uh, deficiency. Uh, and uh, if you would have known the amount of calcium you need to apply, you could have taken care of this. You know, uh, liming could have taken care of this. So that's why you see how critical it is. This is coming during the production phase when, they, when the fruits are forming and you're losing harvest, you're losing the effort and the time and the labor you put in producing this fruit. Uh, this 
uh, blossom and rot is also caused by uh, irregular watering. So if you did not water your plants in a proper way, right time, right amount, you will suffer uh, uh, with this blossom and rot. So uh, uh, irrigation is also important in mitigating the risk of having uh, a blossom and rot. This is how the blossom and rot starts. You can see this, see this is the starting of it, small black discoloration. And if you don't manage it, you can see how it grows and it can get bigger and, and render the fruit non-marketable. So again, calcium and irrigation. So those are the two ways you mitigate risk of, uh, of, of blossom and rot. More blossom and rot pictures for you. Uh, this is in, in, in pepper uh, and more, this is blossom, this is, this is not blossom and rot, but this is calcium, uh, leaf tip burn in lettuce. Uh, imagine having a wonderful head of lettuce and then you start seeing that the tips of the leaves are brown or brownish and nobody would buy that lettuce. They would look for no browning, only green mass. So again, this renders this head of lettuce non-marketable. Um, so uh, again, uh, making sure you know we, we don't end up here. We need to make apply the calcium and irrigation properly. Many ways you can mitigate that risk: gypsum, you know, calcium sulfate, calcium nitrate. Uh, uh, through fertigation is an excellent way uh, to manage that risk. So I, I mentioned that water also is critical to uh, limit the occurrence of blossom and rot. And in this picture, you can see uh, 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 the soil moisture and the time. So uh, uh, often I would say, you know, if you don't pay attention on your irrigation, you are, you are watering like this. Your soil moisture, you water a lot and your soil moisture is up there in the saturation phase. And then you don't water for maybe seven, 10 days. The soil becomes very dry. And then you again water here and then again goes up. So it's, you know, like a roller coaster ride. Plants don't like this. What plants like is something like this. So where, yeah, you, you water in not a lot, but you know the required amount. And I'll tell you there are ways you can measure that. And then it becomes dry, not totally dry, a little dry, you again water. So it's more of a slow roller coaster. And this is what you want. Um, uh, and this will eliminate uh, blossom and rot. So just managing your irrigation properly uh, uh, will, will get rid of the blossom and rot issue in addition to the calcium concentration in the soil. Um, many of our vegetable growers use drip irrigation and one of the things they have to decide when they buy their drip tubes or the drip uh, lines is the emitter spacing of how far are the emitters on this drip tube or the drip uh, uh, tape. And you can see this example. Uh, in this case, the emitter spacing is eight inches and in this case, the emitter spacing is 12 inches. So uh, depending on what type of crop you are growing, you have to decide what emitter spacing you want. If it's something that is taking up the entire bed, some leafy greens, uh, if you have a larger age area, carrots, for example, if you have a larger area, maybe better to go for eight inch emitter spacing because it wets the entire bed as compared to the 12 inch emitter spacing. So you can see how just deciding of what emitter spacing you use can dictate how the water is being spread in your plot and the amount of time you have to run that irrigation. So thinking through drip irrigation is very critical and also about what emitter spacing to use. Typically in vegetable production, eight or 12 inches is great. You know, if you're growing tomatoes, peppers, 12 inches okay, but it won't hurt to use eight. You might not have to run it for a long time as compared to 12 inch, but you can see how uniform the water is being spread when it's eight inch emitter spacing. Uh, soils also impact how water, how, uh, of how the water will spread. In the left here, sandy soil, when you, if this is a drip tape, uh, the water just goes mostly, you know, vertical. If it's a loamy soil, it spreads a little bit more horizontal. If it's a clay soil, it's even more bigger. So depending on the type of soil, you might have to run your irrigation for, you know, the time of the irrigation, the duration. Uh, it could be you know, longer time or, or shorter. With the sandy soil, you don't want to run your irrigation for an extended period of time because most of the water is going down. So in sandy soil, frequent irrigation with smaller amounts, every two, three days, a small amount is better uh, as compared to in clay soil where you apply a lot at the time and then you wait for a few days and then you apply. So just wanted to put the soil structure uh, or the soil uh, uh, texture into perspective of how that can dictate how moisture is, is taken or, or moves within the soil profile. 
Uh, still on the nutrition part of, of risk management, this is magnesium deficiency uh, in pepper. You can see this intervenal chlorosis, uh, uh, and that's a classic symptom of magnesium in the lower leaves. Easily manageable by you know, applying CalMag, it's, it's a fertilizer, uh, has calcium and magnesium, or Epsom salt, magnesium sulfate, that can be sprayed uh, foliarly or even through the drip. Uh, so there are ways to manage risk, as long as you know what the risk is and how to identify it. So uh, this is magnesium deficiency. And again, uh, it's not the end of the world when you see this, you can apply through drip and foliar and, and the plants will be healthy uh, once they get that magnesium. But again, bringing the focus back to soil nutrition and soil fertility of knowing what is there in the soil is very critical. Okay, so now we are moving to the next topic and which is mitigating your crop establishment risk by using high quality transplants, vegetable transplants. Now it doesn't apply to many crops which are direct seeded. For example, uh, sweet corn or, or carrot, uh, uh, beets, you know, you would just direct seed them. But other crops such as, you know, cucumber, it could be watermelon, it could be peppers, tomatoes, eggplant, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, those, are, those, those, those can be grown using transplants. And that is, is, is a game changer when it comes to managing risk because when you use transplants, you know, you get uniform germination because you grow the seedlings first and then you plant them outside. So when you do it in a controlled environment, it could be a greenhouse, it could be a high tunnel early in the spring with a heater or something to keep things warm. Uh, but when you use transplants, you know, when these seeds, when you're putting in these trays, you get uniform seed germination, you can eliminate variability caused by direct seeding. So imagine when you're seeding directly in the ground, there are many things that are affecting that seed. Uh, insects can come and chew on it. There are uh, pathogens in the soil that can rot the seed, inclement weather, hardening of the soil surface. So, you know, hard pans so the seeds cannot pop up. So there are many challenges there. But with transplants, you can avoid that and, and, and uh, have less variability. You can start things early, you can extend your growing season. And of course, research has shown that uh, uh, there is enhanced yield and productivity when you use transplants versus direct seeding. So again, transplants are a great way to mitigate establishment risk. Any problem in this picture? Uh, uh, this is, these are uh, uh, cucumber transplants. Uh, and one of the aspects I want to highlight here is that even though you're using transplants, you need to grow them well and grow them for the right amount of time. So in this case, these are cucumber seedlings which sat in the flats for an extended period of time, I would say about four weeks, and the plants competed for light and the plants elongated, the transplants elongated. And when you plant them outside, like a seedling which is so long, the wind beats on it, you know, you can see in this picture, this plant has even snapped here. So uh, growing transplants the right way uh, so that you don't create risk out in the field. So high quality transplants, nice and stout and compact uh, and, and growing in them for the right time. You know, tomatoes, uh, peppers, eggplant, six to eight weeks, cucumbers, uh, squash. I mean, if you're using transplants, it's only two weeks or three weeks. You should not be keeping them in the tray for a long time. Um, so mitigating risk that way. So wanted to show you uh, even in the risk, even in the, uh, in the act of uh, growing your transplants. If you don't grow them well, uh, you are pu putting yourself to risk. Uh, these are three transplants that were grown for four weeks. These are tomatoes. You can see the left one was grown in a greenhouse. All of them actually was grown in a greenhouse. Oh, uh, two of them, sorry, not the third one, but greenhouse with high pressure sodium lamp. And you can see the quality of the transplant here. This is just greenhouse without HPS lamp, still not bad. Uh, but in the greenhouse, so we monitor or we manage the temperature and the light in there. Uh, in this case, there was no high pressure sodium lamp, this had it. But in this case, this transplant was grown under fluorescent light, uh, not in the greenhouse, actually in the head house. And you can see fluorescent light did not allow this plant to add in a lot of biomass. Even all of them were grown for four weeks. So you can see when you plant something like this outside, you are mitigating a lot of things, you know, you're mitigating your establishment risk, you are providing a push towards productivity and, and quicker and higher yields in this plant versus this plant. So uh, transplant production is critical uh, and, and we need to make sure we do everything to, to manage risk with transplants. 
this is improper watering in the greenhouse when you're growing transplant. So you can see, uh, and, and, and I, I talk about this, uh, watering is the most mundane and most low priority jobs in the spring in the greenhouse and you allocate it to, you know, you don't pay much attention to it. Somebody has to just go and water. But I feel that is the most critical job which, which uh, you can assign to someone. So assign it to someone who you, who you are really comfortable and, and, and confident, even, even yourself, take it very seriously. In this case, the plants, you know, somebody was not watering the edges well. And you see this nice bell-shaped curve where the plants in the middle are tall and then the edges are small. Yeah, and, and so this is improper watering. Again, increasing risk, more than risk, you are losing these transplants on the edges. You're not gonna be planting these outside. If you do, you're already putting yourself to a setback mode because they are small, they're not grown. Uh, so uh, even in the transplant production phase, mitigate risk by making sure you're watering properly. In the second flat here, the watering was even poor, maybe it got dried out. You know, you can see this uneven germination. Think of the, amount of money you have spent on this quality seed. Nowadays, seeds are so expensive uh, and maybe not even available in some cases just because the scarcity of so many people growing. So uh, please, you know, make sure we mitigate risk by growing good quality transplants and also uh, uh, taking care of our transplants when we are growing them. So uh, moving to the field. Okay, so the transplant phase, now the production risk, especially when it comes to risk management in the field. And you know, if you have not used raised beds, many of our vegetable growers do use raised beds with drip irrigation, but that's an excellent way uh, to, to mitigate many of the risks which are out production risk. So this is our tomato and eggplant production. You can see on, on black plastic mulch and raised bed with drip tape, but the raised beds provide a lot of benefit. One with plastics. One, earliness, you can get your crop uh, start to yield quickly. Uh, so you, you, if, the if the plant or the crop sits in the field for a longer amount of time, more chances of insects issues, disease issues, weather issues. So we get earliness because of the plastics and the raised bed. Weed control, uh, um, we can see that we do have to weed between the rows, but within the row, the plastic takes care of it. So the raised bed system with plastic mulch is great to manage weeds high yield and quality, soil cover for fumigation, disease control, low fertilizer and water use, reduce nitrate leaching. So there are tremendous benefits of using a plastic mulch based raised bed system in vegetable production because it can handle all of these risks or at least help you handle all of these risks. So do consider nowadays the plastic mulch layer is, is not that expensive, 1500, 1400 to $1,500. Uh, it's an investment you you will you will uh, definitely you can't go wrong on it you will you'll capitalize on it right from day one so consider that drip irrigation you saw in that picture drip irrigation helps with making sure the right amount of water the right place you know uh, it's savings in terms of water and fertilizer uh, more efficiency low pressure so low energy uh, lower disease and weed pressure so let's say if you had an overhead irrigation system you are one wasting that water Two, you are splashing all that soil onto the crop and that's how the diseases get onto the crop. So all those things are being mitigated by having drip irrigation. And of course, lower labor costs too. You know, once you set it up, setting up is not that difficult or challenging. So uh, a drip, investing in drip irrigation is a great way of mitigating risk, production risk out in, in the field. And again, many other benefits in addition to risk mitigation. Now, uh, uh, some you know what if what if you had that drip irrigation system but you were not managing it well so you are again opening up yourself to risk you need to know with the drip irrigation when to irrigate uh, and that oftentimes is a you know you it's it's on the fly we decide oh we'll irrigate once a week or oh it rained yesterday so I don't need to irrigate for the next four or five days so it's more of a very variable and qualitative decision uh, but that decision can be more formalized and more quantified by using some of these sensors. This is a, this is a tensiometer and it will tell you uh, based on the reading, this is the, the pressure reading, the vacuum reading when it reaches 30 PSI, at that point you need to irrigate. When you irrigate, when the soil gets saturated, that 30 reading goes to 10. Uh, and then after three or four days, you'll see the needle coming back to 30, then you again irrigate. But this is a great way where you have a number to look at you have a tool which quantifies when to irrigate and that, that mitigates risk because of lack of proper watering or too much watering. 
because if you water too much, you're leaching all those nutrients beneath the root zone. So too much watering is also a problem in addition to lack of watering or, or less water. So investing in a tool like this uh, is handy. This is about 80 to $90 uh, tensiometer. You can buy more digital tools as well, but this is a simple tool. We use digital and, and the tensiometer. Uh, uh, you can't go wrong either ways. Uh, but another tool to mitigate some risk uh, in, in the irrigation aspect of things. This is something new uh, tool, uh, uh, which some growers I would say in Iowa uh, are using. Uh, there is a lot of interest in my research lab. We have done several experiments uh, showcasing the benefit of vegetable grafting uh, in increasing yield and improving quality uh, and also to mitigate risk because of soil borne pathogens. If you have a high tunnel or a field where you had, let's say, uh, 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 verticillium or fusarium, uh, grafted rootstocks can help. So grafting is basically using a superior rootstock and adding the tomato variety which you want to grow on top of it, you graft together, and then you have a, this grafted plant which you can plant. And this grafted plant uh, can help with disease resistance, it can help with vigor and yield, and can also help with increased tolerance to environmental stress. So grafting could also be used as a risk management tool when it comes to risky propositions or soils which you know had a history of pathogens in the soil. Uh, we, ha we have uh, many publications on this, uh, many research reports, and I'll be more than happy to share that with you if you have, if you have interest. You know, my lab uh, focuses on grafting uh, quite a bit, especially for high tunnel uh, tomato growers. So uh, the other risks which are out there, you know, uh, are the insects. So of course, you know, we, it's better to be prepared uh, uh, one with the type of insects you expect, you know, what kind of insect they'll be there, know their life cycle, and also have, you know, if you are a conventional grower, you can have, a, have handy the insecticides you want to use, even organic growers, organic insecticides, you should have them handy. You should not be shopping for insecticides when you see the insects out there. It's better to be prepared by knowing what are the general pests or insect pests for this crop and then having the things in hand when, it, when, they, when they arrive, you have a tool to manage. So in addition to insecticides, uh, row covers or covering materials, in this case, you can see this row cover here on top of a cucumber row that helps the plant to keep the cucumber beetles away. It also helps to modify the, the, the microclimate so that the plants can grow a little faster because the row covers increase the temperature underneath. So uh, another way of mitigating risk. Uh, th these are the cucumber beetles that are uh, you know, notorious when it comes to cucurbit crops. That's the spotted cucumber beetle. This is the striped cucumber beetle. And what they do is in addition to uh, chewing on it, on the plant, on the fruit, on the leaf, and reducing the productivity of the plant, they also kill the plant because they spread diseases. And in this case, the bacterial wilt is spread by uh, cucumber beetle. So having some kind of a risk management tool already, already ready, it could be insecticide, it could be row covers, um, uh, uh, and just the thought of you know, knowing what your pest is uh, and being ready is a great risk management tool. Uh, more picture of the row covers. We are using this uh, you know, early in the spring, again, to uh, enhance the uh, temperature underneath and also to protect the plants. If it's an organic, especially if it's an organic farm or an organic crop, uh, you, need, you cannot use many of these synthetic insecticides. You can use organic insecticide, but they are expensive. So maybe investing in row covers is a risk management tool. Damage of cucumber beetles on cucumbers. Of course, nobody would like to buy a cucumber which has these cosmetic defect. This is caused by cucumber beetle. So uh, if we don't manage the beetles, we're gonna end up here. We, we don't want to be here. So uh, just to show you some examples. There are many insecticides that are out there. I'm not gonna highlight any one of them, but again, the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide, it's, it's a good resource to have. It's available online. Uh, you can download the PDF. Uh, and and uh, it is a great resource for insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, and many other topics too. So we use that extensively. Midwest Vegetable Production Guide. You can download it for free. Uh, you can uh, uh, buy a hard copy too. It's I think, I think $10, uh, somewhere in that range. Okay, a new mat material we are testing here at the Hot Research Station is the ProTech netting. In this case, we are using it on organic broccoli production to keep the loopers away. You know, the loopers or the imported cabbage worms 
uh, that attack uh, broccoli and coal crops. So this is a great risk management tool, uh, uh, not to use insect, organic insecticide, but rather using protectnet. Uh, in the field, a uh, few other tactics or, or topics I would, I would like to bring your attention to would be thinking of not just you know, these tools and um, methods and, and, and something to spray, but also about the bigger picture of uh, the broader term risk management. So use of cover crops. Many vegetable growers uh, are using cover crops in some form or the other. Uh, cover crops are a great, great risk management tool because they help to build the soil. The better soil, the better crop. The better crop, the better fruit. And they can handle some of these insects and disease out there. So uh, a healthy crop is what our goal should be. And by adding cover crops, you can add organic matter. You can reduce soil erosion. Uh, that's, that's a great tool, uh, especially at the end of the growing season when you are done growing your cash crops. Seed cover crops, and as the name suggests, it's, it's covering the soil. There are so many options when it comes to cover crop. Uh, cereal rye, um, triticale, uh, annual rye grass, uh, spring wheat for the fall. Uh, and then there are many uh, short duration cover crops, you know, oil seed radish, yellow mustard, teff, sorghum sudan grass, cowpea, and some of them are, these are legumes, so they can even add nitrogen. So you are mitigating your nutrition risk or fertility risk by adding cover crops uh, in the picture. Uh, so uh, do consider cover crops and, and think seriously of integrating them in your production system. If they help reduce soil compaction, you know, oil seed radish, you know, yellow mustard, some of these brassica can have this taproot system that can break compaction and improve soil nutrient re recycling. Some of the nutrients are already in the soil. You don't have to keep adding every year. All you need is the cycling of it. Something that brings it up into it, you put it back, the other crops use it, you again bring it up, again use it. So it's kind of a cycle you are promoting. So uh, do give uh, good attention to using cover crops at your farm as a risk management tool. This is at uh, Geisler Farms. I took this picture in 2017. Daryl Geisler, he's using uh, a cereal rye, rolled cereal rye uh, as a weed management tool. So in this case, you can see how cover crops are helping with weed management. This is his pumpkin plot. Uh, picture taken somewhere in August, July, August. Uh, and then uh, once the crop is done, everything is harvested, he will till everything under. So that adds organic matter. So as you can see how cover crops are benefiting in several ways, improving soil biology, adding organic matter, providing weed suppression. So less herbicides or, or almost no herbicides. So see how cover crops have now have multifaceted role when it comes to risk management. And, and who, who won't want a field like this <laughs> where you have no weeds at all? Weeds uh, are, are perennially a, a, a challenge to manage. But in, in this case, I mean, this is amazing. Even though there are some escapes, you can go and pull them out. But a great way to manage weeds using cover crops. Uh, finally, uh, uh, you know, few few things. Uh, use of high tunnels is a great resource to manage risks uh, for vegetable producers. And many of our growers are investing in it. You know, there is an NRCS program, Equip Environmental Quality Incentive Program, that provides money or subsidy to uh, growers to install this. So you might two thirds of the cost is already covered. Sometimes even the entire cost is covered, but do look into that equip program to have a high tunnel at your place. What are the benefits of high tunnel? Uh, low cost structure for high value crops, you know, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, protection from wind, uh, irrigation control. Since you can see there is no way rain is going to get in there, you have to install the drip yourself. So when you know you, you are installing it and there's no other external rainfall, you can manage your irrigation really, really well and time it at the right time. Uh, uh, that's an advantage. Season extension, you know, early and late crops. Typically, tomatoes are planted outside uh, mid, uh, 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 mid May, you know, for central Iowa. With high tunnels, we can go mid April. Uh, so that's, you know, a season extension, one, and one entire month of extra growth. And the more you grow quickly, you can bring it to the market early, you can get a better price. So high tunnels are a great tool. It has definitely been served as a game changer for vegetable production here in the state. It also helps with uh, uh, managing risk in terms of quality. Imagine you have a tomato field, open field, and, and they, nothing wrong with having tomatoes open field, but there are risks. If there's a rain event, a heavy rain event, the plant is going to take up the moisture and the fruits are going to crack. 
Now this fruit has become non-marketable. But if it's a high tunnel, you don't have that challenge. Of course, last last year we had challenge with the derecho, which which had a you know severe beating which uh, on the high tunnel. Many of our growers lost the, their high tunnels. We lost many at the, at the research station. So that's obviously a challenge. But overall, I mean, high tunnels are, are, are an important tool as a risk management tool. And of course, when there is less rain or no rain inside the high tunnel and no water on the leaves and the fruit, you have less diseases. So that's how you increase the yield and you also improve the quality of your produce when you go inside the high tunnel. I wanna show you here <clears throat> the value of high tunnel for cucumber production. So this is the Chicago market price for cucumber for one one by nine bushel carton of cucumber. The price is about $22, $23 in June. And July hits, boom, the price goes down to almost like $9 for the same amount, about a $9 drop. And that's because there are not many people who are bringing cucumber to the market in June, like beginning of June or middle of June. But if you have a high tunnel, you can be one of them and you can get a higher price. But in July, the field production comes in the picture. So many people are bringing, so it's a supply and demand thing. There's so much of cucumber that the price goes down. So with a high tunnel, you can get an incentive of bringing your produce early to the market. <clears throat> now, in the high tunnel, I, I gave you a lot of good points about benefits of high tunnel or use of high tunnel. There is risk management in the high tunnel too. You need to manage the risk. This is our specialty melons inside the high tunnel. Uh, this is in April. We planted beginning of April so that we can capture the early market. But then there was a frost. Uh, coming. I think it was 30 degrees and cucumbers, 29, 30 degrees. So cucumbers can't take it. They, they will be just, you know, you know, just wiped out. So we had to think of covering our cucumbers with this uh, uh, row cover. And that's a, and we saved it. We saved our crop by using row covers and, and, and we did put some additional heaters in there, but that's a risk management tool. Now your row cover is serving as a risk management for cucumbers. Uh, the other thing we use is this electric heater. Uh, we installed it there and just for that night when the temperature was going down to almost 30, we covered with the row cover, we put a heater and that saved our crop again. Uh, so think of risk man, just because you have a high tunnel doesn't mean that you have covered all your risks. There are risks inside the high tunnels too and there are ways to manage them. So electric heater, you can also use a propane heater. If you have one like a high tunnel, a 30 by 96, if you put two uh, on e each ends and blowing air to the center, you know, they can also help mitigate that frost risk. So, uh, so do consider that even if you have a high tunnel of some kind of a temporary heating arrangement for those you know, challenging days. Intercropping as a risk management tool. So can we crop, you know, grow multiple things? So let's look at this quickly. Uh, what are the benefits of intercropping, which means crop growing one or two crop, more than one crop at the same time in the same place. Uh, so you can reduce insect pests, you can suppress diseases, physical support to each other. Again, that depends on, you know, if you're growing on raised bed, maybe that doesn't work. Uh, soil protection improvement, reduced risk of associated with single crop. Yeah, if you, let's say one event, the entire crop is gone, you are at loss. So, but if you have two crops, at least that risk is spread. So I'll give you an example. This is an experiment uh, which I conducted on, on cucumbers and tomatoes. You can see cucumber and tomatoes intercropped in this system. Uh, you can see the crop, how they look like. There is some insect issues. Can, this is because of cucumber beetle. Some plants are dying. Uh, this is intercrop and right next to it is a monocrop lot. And so this is the monoculture. And you can see the entire more plants in the monoculture crops are destroyed as compared to cucumbers in the intercrop. So definitely the intercrop is working, especially with the insects. In this case, cucumber beetle. So we quantitatively found that out too. So uh, ceased, uh, monocrop, and an intercrop, C and NC stand for compost and no compost. But look at this, plants dead at fourth harvest. 46, 35% of the plants are dead in the monoculture plots as compared to 14 and 12 in the, uh, in the intercrop. So intercrop can serve as a great tool for insect pest management uh, uh, and a great risk management. So if you were going to anyway grow half an acre of tomato, half an acre of cucumber, just blend it together to one acre and one after the other, as long as it's on the There are some challenges in how you are planting them, whether they're on the raised beds. If, if both the crops are on the raised beds, plastic mulch, very similar spacing, you can, you can 
intercrop them and, and mitigate the risk, especially with the insects. So this is a great uh, data to show you. Seventh harvest, monocrop 63, 52% dead. Intercrop 30 to 34% dead. And, and so uh, the insects come in, but they get distracted because there are multiple crops. There are you know, volatiles coming out of this plant, which is distracting the plants. Uh, and that's how, that's the hypothesis of why intercrop system is working better than the monocrop system, but do consider intercropping. Finally, you know, the risk management aspect, it comes to diverse cropping system, diversity in your farm, crop rotations. You know, think of long-term, not just growing the same crop or two or three crops again and again at the same spot, but rotate it, you know, so that you can get better soils, you can uh, get better yields, you can better recycle or cycle the nutrients. So risk management on the long run, you know, think of crop rotation, think of diversity, different types of crops you want to grow uh, for better nutrient cycling, for yield increases, for reduced pest incidences. And uh, uh, this is something I wanted to share with you finally uh, here is that uh, maximize years between crops in the same family. You all know about it. This is crop rotation. Don't put the same crop from the same family in the same spot. Three to four years is great alternate deep and shallow rooted crops. Uh, that helps with nutrient cycling and better use of the nutrients. Alternate legumes with non-legumes. Again, legumes can push the nitrogen, fix the nitrogen and the other crop can use it. Use cleaning crops and I'll talk about it in a bit and, and plan to give opportunities to improve soil by you know, adding cover crops, by resting the soil and not always putting it into in intensive production. So these slides will be available to you. This presentation will be on YouTube so you can check it out. But uh, this is Elliot uh, uh, Coleman's eight, hour, eight year crop rotation. You don't have to do exactly what it is, but just the, I want to set the foundation up for you here. So sweet corn uh, is followed by potatoes. Uh, after potatoes, you put squash. Squash is more of a cleaning crop because of the, uh, the way it grows. It could be watermelon. Uh, um, it could be pumpkin. They don't allow the weeds to grow that well. And so less weed pressure for the next crop, which is root crop, which is very poor in, in comp competing with weeds. You put beans, there has been no yield decline after a root crop in beans. Then you put tomatoes because that's about four years away from potato here. Uh, you can put English peas after that, cabbage family. And between all these time, you have op opportunities to do a cover crop. You can cover crop here in the middle in the fall here as well. But this is just to set the stage up to think more uh, in, in a long-term basis of crop rotation and biodiversity as a tool to manage risk uh, uh, at, your, at your farm. There are constraints with crop rotation, money. <laughs> you want to grow a crop that makes money, that has to be balanced in economics and, and the biological consideration. Market dictates that. I'm just putting it there so that I, you know that I know that these are the things that dictate how you choose crops. Uh, but but uh, uh, make sure crop rotation and, and diversity is at the forefront when it comes to uh, risk management. Uh, and finally, you know, uh, there is definitely a rising demand for fresh and local food, importance to sustainable ag. There is a lot of opportunity for job creation, retention, economic stability uh, with specialty crops. So uh, we are at an ex exciting times. There's, there's a lot, lot going on. So as vegetable growers, I hope you are capitalizing on it. There's a lot of momentum with this pandemic from direct to farmer to consumer sales increasing, many people interested in local foods and buying fresh. Uh, so everything is working uh, hopefully in, a, in, in the good. And, and in summary, some things to keep in mind what I presented today, you know, use of transplants, high tunnels, cover crops, weed management with you know, uh, raised bed production, niche crops, crops which you can diversify and grow. Uh, we have expanded into sweet potatoes now quite uh, widely at the farm. It grows really well here. And uh, so, so think of crops, you know, kale is a good example with many growers have pivoted towards growing that kohlrabi, Brussels sprout, marketing, nutrient management, crop diversity. And, and finally, thanks to all the funding agencies and our partners who help me and my research group and our team here in horticulture department to work with you, know, uh, you all and help you all. So feel free to reach out to us anytime. This is my information. Uh, uh, my email and phone number. There's a, I have a website which, where we put all the reports and all the information and the videos which we make in the lab. So feel free to go there, uh, check those resources out, but I'll be more than happy to answer questions. I know we are looking towards a weekend which is gonna be really 
cold. Hopefully not this much snow, uh, but uh, be safe and, and healthy and uh, uh, I'll be more than happy to, to answer uh, questions. Thank you very much, Ajay, for sharing that information with us and for joining us today. If anyone does have any questions, um, you are welcome to unmute yourself or drop any questions for Ajay you have in the chat box. Ajay, while we're waiting for questions, you mm -hmm. mentioned that sweet potatoes are growing really well here. And I was just curious if there are other crops that you are seeing that maybe haven't traditionally been grown in Iowa that you're seeing a resurgence for. Sure. So there was a, there is a notion that sweet potato is a summer or a southern crop, uh, but that's not the case. We can grow it really well here in Iowa. Uh, of course, if you have a raised bed system with plastic that helps with the heat units for the crop to grow, uh, locally grown sweet potatoes, you know, restaurants are in interested in it. You might, have not, you might have noticed you go to a restaurant if you want to replace your regular fries with sweet potato fries, you have to pay $1 a little more. So there is incentive, there's money that could be made. Uh, but some other crops which we see, you know, uh, which have potential, you know, I think of uh, you know, these, these snacking cucumbers, the seedless cucumbers. There is a market for it. I mean, people are looking for healthy diet, you know, lunch snacks, the small cucumbers, which can be one or two can be easily eaten. Uh, by, by one person. So uh, that's a, a good high tunnel crop as well. Uh, crops, uh, you know, which, which uh, edamame is a good crop. I, I have slowly started, you know, looking into it, uh, given the health benefits. Many of our growers are already growing soybean. So it's actually a, a legume and uh, it's a vegetable legume. So it's not soybean, but it's harvested early. So is there a way we can, you know, expand on that? Uh, and see if we can expand the acreage because our growers are well versed with machinery, with tools, and this is something which they don't have to do, to, like total 180 degree turn. They already have some experience growing soybean. Uh, potatoes are, are slowly increasing uh, in acreage. We are seeing them in the top five crops because they are storage crops. Onions are a good example. So you will notice that you know, some of these crops are storage crops. So. Uh, growers don't have to worry about growing and selling them quickly. They can store them. Onions, you know, carrots, uh, uh, potatoes, uh, um, and you know the food uh, junkie, you know, among us and the health aspect crops such as you know kale, Brussels sprout, a great crop to grow. Again, not a lot of market for it yet, but there is interest. There are many growers who are selling Brussels sprout for the, on the entire stem with all the uh, all the Brussels sprout out there. Uh, uh, that is also a, you know, a good crop to grow. And then some traditional crops, which Iowa has been growing for a while, uh, but that can be brought to the forefront. And I think of one crop is watermelon. I mean, who among us doesn't want to bite into a nice red watermelon in the summer, Iowa grown. Uh, and it's a great crop to you know, bring people into your farm. There, there was a speaker from Kansas who spoke at the Iowa Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association talk on watermelon and how it helped him to expand his market. So you know, some of the traditional crops can also be brought to the forefront. Thank you, Ajay. Um, if there are no other questions, um, thank you for your time today, Ajay. And this will be up on YouTube and you all will get a link if you'd like to rewatch it later. Thank you very much, Olivia and Krista and all others who were there. Uh, enjoy talking about this because uh, this is something we need to keep the conversation going of risk management. It's never going to leave us. It's always going to be with us. So thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you, Ajay.